Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we shall start within one minute. Uh, please check that uh, you actually hear us well. Uh, Maria, could you please kindly say that uh, everything's clear and uh, everyone can see me and hear us? Yes, Lana, everything is clear. I can see you, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, all right, then, well, let's probably start since uh, later on, I believe everyone can join us within a few uh, minutes. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, pretty flattered to, to uh, invite everyone who joined us for the first time. And I'm very happy to see everyone uh, who actually join uh, each hour. Uh, event regularly. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lana Vesolova. I'm uh, International Partnership Manager of Seabons uh, Group, uh, which is actually a conference house arranging different events on the financial markets worldwide. And uh, we actually are also a data vendor of uh, information for bonds, equities. Uh, we monitor all the global financial markets, uh, having full picture that is why we provide the opportunity to uh, have a good um, place where people can actually meet uh, share their ideas uh, learn the best practices from the best of the best uh, so today i will host the event and moderate uh, our discussion uh, I should say this event is rather a unique one because usually we uh, arrange um, some events for particular markets, like focusing on a particular uh, European uh, market or maybe a Latin American market. But this time I just noticed that we have uh, the listeners from 50 uh, and even more than uh, 50 countries. Uh, worldwide um, uh, and we actually have our speakers also uh, joined us worldwide that is why we'll have a uh, rather clear picture I uh, and this time we decided um, to have not kind of a very um, brand uh, usual event so usually we uh, try to arrange uh, the events with rather vast topics discussing different uh, investment ideas and comparing uh, different um, markets which one is, uh, gives us a better yield but this time we decided to make it more practical uh, and uh, with the most efficient focus uh, and essential fo focus which is required in the current environment uh, so today we stated um, our main question of this event as how to evaluate risks uh, in the bond investments nowadays and um, our professionals um, uh, can give us many sided opinion on, on this point as each of them have uh, different focuses. So uh, thus we'll start with the assessments of risk in the corporate credit uh, markets with uh, Stefan Kolig uh, from uh, Unicredit. He joined us from Germany. Uh, then we'll get the opinion on the current credit outlook uh, for uh, some European corporates with Nick Kramer who joined us very early in the morning uh, from the heart of uh, the US in New York. And uh, then we'll have rather practical uh, section with portfolio managers um, who basically manage the portfolios of uh, a few billions. Uh, every day uh, they evaluate risks and their performance of the portfolios are rather striking. They have really high yield uh, investments and basically, well, uh, Switzerland is always considered to be as a, a mecca for investments, so probably uh, no surprise that we have both uh, portfolio managers um, joined us from uh, Switzerland. Uh, we'll have Andreas Schwin from Jan uh, Swiss Consulting and Marcus Metier, um, who will join from um, Claris Capital. Uh, at the end, um, also I will as I pretty, pretty actively work with uh, different portfolio investors of uh, institutional types or 
like five years already. Um, so I have rather good experience uh, and happy to share some knowledge on my part. Um, what kind of indicators you should um, give, um, take into consideration when you uh, need to pick the healthy investment and how to avoid the, uh, some risks keeping the performance of your portfolio rather high then. Um, so we also left some time for the discussion and uh, this event should be very interactive. Um, so uh, first of all, I want you to leave uh, the comments in our chat from which country you uh, just uh, joined us. Uh, so it will give us a better idea what kind of markets we'll uh, discuss today. And please uh, leave your uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I will pick the most interesting ones and uh, we'll get many-sided opinion of, uh, from the speakers uh, right after their speech. Uh, so be active and well, let's start. Um, so let me pass the floor to our first speaker, um, Stefan Kolik. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, he's uh, joined us from uh, uh, Unicredit Group. He is a senior corporate uh, credit strategist. He is mainly focused on some emerging European corporate um, credits. Uh, so he has very uh, good experience over 20 years uh, covering all these uh, markets. And uh, he's actually one of our most active speakers, I should say, for about the last uh, eight years. So his opinion is very, very uh, valuable as always. So, uh, Stefan, uh, please join us. Great. Let me. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, Stefan, thank you. We can see you and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for the introductory uh, words, Lana. Um, basically, um, in my presentation, uh, the following uh, like 20, 25 minutes, uh, I will um, discuss uh, um, or try to shed uh, some light on the key risk factors uh, uh, we see um, relevant for the European um, credit markets. Uh, my approach is more kind of pan-European markets, uh, um, uh, looking both on uh, um, um, Western European, but also on the uh, emerging uh, European emerging markets. Uh, um, basically, um, uh, we live obviously we live in extraordinary times. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, um, although um, epidemics uh, uh, have not been um, um, such a rare event uh, in the in the his, um, humankind history, um, this kind of um, uh, epidemics uh, uh, we are uh, coping with uh, currently is uh, some kind of uh, uh, black uh, black swan. Um, in uh, nonetheless, uh, but also the policy response uh, uh, from policymakers across the globe uh, um, has been unprecedented, uh, uh, which uh, actually, um, uh, in uh, our view, um, uh, has alleviated substantially uh, also um, uh, the risk in uh, in global uh, credit markets. Uh, um, I would like to um, to shed some light uh, on uh, three uh, major risks. Uh, I think uh, um, credit investors are um, hoping with um, uh, in the uh, medium term, and um, uh, this is not not only uh, purely uh, COVID nineteen related. First of all, um, uh, it, it, is, it is also um, uh, related uh, to the geopolitical um, uh, constellation uh, we are living in and the uh, tensions uh, um, re results uh, in the um, uh, from tensions between um, the US and uh, China, which presents beside the um, COVID-19 related uh, risks, uh, uh, which in my view are for the corporate credit uh, investor, uh, first of all, uh, the economic growth and the visibility going forward. Uh, and uh, market liquidity. Um, it's also uh, the uh, possibility of uh, uh, scale up of uh, tensions uh, between the two su superpowers and uh, um, uh, implementation of uh, uh, economic um, uh, um, instruments uh, 
uh, i.e. Uh, economic sanction. But let me uh, go through the presentation. Um, uh, as I said, uh, economic growth is uh, uh, one of one major uh, risk uh, factor we are uh, witnessing currently. Um, and uh, it's related basically to the uh, lockdown uh, policymakers have implemented uh, um, in, uh, in second quarter of this year. And it is um, the uh, slump in economic growth uh, is uh, nicely related uh, to, to this as uh, reflected in mobility indicators. The chart uh, I'm showing now is uh, uh, plots the Google mobility indicator um, versus the uh, um, first quarter uh, um, uh, GDP uh, growth. And uh, we, we saw uh, already, we see a very pretty strong uh, correlation. Uh, yeah, um, we, we obviously this uh, um, the alleviation of um, uh, lockdowns uh, um, leads to a rebound uh, of economic activity, which is good news. Uh, um, nonetheless, uh, uh, we think that the visibility is uh, very still pretty low, and it still needs to be seen um, what kind of economic um, uh, recovery. Uh, we will uh, be uh, witnessing. Um, on a more frequent uh, data, um, PMI show, showed already a pretty strong uh, rebound, as you can see in, in the second uh, slide, uh, both in uh, major uh, economies uh, on the, uh, the left-hand uh, side, uh, i.e. Uh, China, Eurozone, and the US, but also in the number of uh, European uh, emerging European economies. Nonetheless, although the uh, recent PMI data uh, are uh, in most cases about uh, the 50 threshold pointing uh, uh, economic extent, uh, expansion, uh, this does not mean that uh, the economic activity is at the levels uh, before, the, uh, before the lockdowns. Uh, it indicates only that, uh, uh, that the um, uh, economy, uh, that uh, um, Participants uh, expect uh, um, a positive uh, uh, economic activity, uh, see uh, an expansion of uh, uh, economic activity, but from uh, extremely low um, levels. And as I said, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, about uh, the future shape, the sh shape of the recovery. Will it be a kind of V-shaped recovery, U-shaped, W or L? Um, more, I think uh, most uh, uh, market participants uh, uh, do not expect uh, any kind of uh, rapid uh, V-shape recovery. Uh, our house expects kind of uh, U-shape, uh, a gradual recovery with uh, economy, major economies uh, still remaining um, below potential uh, for at least uh, um, into uh, throughout uh, 2021. Um, the, uh, uh, there is also a big uh, uncertainty whether we will not see a, a double, bit, double deep recession, a kind of a, um, W recovery. Uh, this is uh, a risk factor, uh, certainly not completely out of the, out of the cards, uh, uh, taking account that uh, uh, there is a risk of a second wave of, uh, of uh, pandemic. Um, when you look at it into history, um, I think that there are two um, major pandemics uh, in uh, human uh, history uh, over the past uh, uh, centuries. And this was uh, the uh, Black Death in the Middle Ages, which plucked Europe uh, for uh, long term, for several centuries, actually. Um, and it was, it's the uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Spanish flu in 1918, uh, at the, which sparked, uh, um, uh, which started at the end of the um, uh, World War I and uh, plucked the world also uh, for two or three years and came in three waves. So there is a precedence case uh, for this kind of, uh, of um, uh, um, development. Nonetheless, uh, if you look at the, the current times, uh, we are much better prepared to cope, cope with uh, such an event, uh, um, uh, both from technological point of view and also from uh, from uh, sanitary uh, sanitary um, uh, point of view. This in turn, this economic growth aspect has obviously uh, very um, uh, an emin eminent uh, 
uh, impact on uh, micro fundamentals of uh, corporates. Uh, uh, needless to say uh, that uh, um, uh, earnings uh, uh, have suffered, uh, as you see in the in the chart, uh, um, uh, which plots the um, the uh, stocks uh, Europe. Uh, um, uh, 600 uh, uh, 12 month uh, forward uh, weighted uh, earnings per share uh, uh, expectations and uh, um, on the uh, left hand uh, uh, the uh, MSCI emerging markets uh, uh, earnings EPS uh, um, uh, the, the left hand chart uh, plotted versus the European uh, uh, IBOX high yield index uh, um, and the, uh, the um, uh, right hand versus the uh, emerging markets uh, corporate index. Uh, um, the uh, two time series are in each uh, of the markets uh, very closely um, um, correlated. Uh, uh, and also we, we saw a rebound of the, of the um, earnings expectations uh, uh, and the current uh, current earnings season um, suggests a pretty uh, a solid results. So we need to keep in mind that they come on the back of uh, uh, very low uh, expectations. Uh, and it still needs to be, be seen how this will uh, feed through in into credit metrics. Uh, for sure, um, uh, we will see uh, another uh, a wave of, uh, of defaults. Uh, um, we expect uh, um, the chart uh, um, I'm showing now is, uh, shows the uh, global US and European uh, default rates uh, as uh, published by Moody's. Uh, um, um, we expect uh, uh, an increase in uh, European uh, default rates uh, uh, towards 9% uh, by the end of the next year uh, from the current, uh, from current uh, uh, 3%. Uh, um, Originally, we were expecting uh, much higher uh, uh, default rates, uh, um, even our, uh, but reduced it following the um, uh, the implementation of uh, uh, massive uh, monetary and fiscal uh, policies. Uh, um, and uh, we are confident that uh, the default rates, uh, at least in Europe, will remain below the uh, peaks we we saw uh, in, uh, for instance, in the. Uh, 2009, um, 2008-2009 um, crisis. Uh, um, and uh, indeed, uh, it's the extraordinary um, fiscal and monetary policy actions uh, um, uh, which uh, are likely to contain a wave of uh, credit events. Uh, if you look at this chart, uh, uh, summarizes uh, the response of a uh, number of uh, uh, governments uh, across the globe uh, uh, to the COVID-19. Uh, what it, the, the two points uh, which are remarkable, uh, worth to highlight. Uh, first of all, uh, on the one hand, um, it's uh, uh, the fact that uh, Italy and Germany uh, provided uh, um, relative to, the, to their GDP the highest uh, fiscal support. Uh, um, in the case of Italy, it's not that much surprising, uh, taking into account that Italy has been um, heavily uh, uh, most uh, uh, heavily uh, impacted by the uh, by the um, uh, by the uh, pandemics, at least in Europe. Um, what is interesting that Germany is uh, provide the German government is providing uh, uh, this massive uh, um, uh, support, uh, close to forty percent uh, of GDP. Um, this is uh, um, uh, despite the fact that Germany has not been uh, uh, affected in that extent, uh, like Italy, Spain, or France uh, by the pandemics. Uh, but take into account that uh, German role in the econ in, uh, European economy, um, the interlinkage of the German eco economy uh, throughout the uh, European economy with the uh, rest of the European economy is pivotal for uh, stability in, uh, in Europe. And this is not, I do not mean that only on the Western Europe, within the Eurozone, Eurozone but also uh, towards uh, the rest of Europe and uh, uh, towards uh, emerging uh, Europe. So stabilization of Europe by fiscal means uh, um, of this uh, size uh, is a, also a good omen for a recovery on a, on a more pan-European uh, scale. And second point, which is uh, uh, interesting in this context, uh, um, which shows the chart, is that majority of the of the 
uh, fiscal support uh, comes in the in the form of uh, um, uh, of uh, fiscal guarantees. Only a minor part, in most cases, comes in uh, in the form of uh, direct uh, fiscal measures uh, like tax cuts uh, or uh, sub uh, subsidiaries. Um, this uh, on on the uh, this means, however, on the flip side that uh, if these uh, guarantees one day are triggered, we might see um, a, trans a, tr a transformation of uh, credit risk uh, from private sector uh, to the, uh, to the um, uh, sovereign sector, uh, potentially affect affecting uh, also um, the uh, sovereign uh, ratings. Uh, um, second um, uh, risk factor uh, I would like to highlight is the uh, is the market liquidity. Um, the uh, um, the chart uh, I'm showing now shows uh, the spread between uh, U.S. LIBOR uh, and uh, Euro Euribor uh, to the um, uh, overnight uh, index uh, swap uh, rate, the OI, uh, OIIS. Uh, um, rate, uh, which gives you a proxy, which serves as a proxy of uh, of um, uh, of uh, liquidity in the in the banking sector, uh, and you see that uh, uh, the, even in in, in the worst uh, in on the peak of the of the crisis uh, this year, uh, the, the, the the spike in uh, in the spread uh, was. Uh, um, nothing comparable to what we saw in the uh, during the 2008-2009 crisis, and this is on the, comes on the back of uh, uh, of a commitment of uh, central banks to provide liquidity de facto in unlimited uh, uh, unlimited uh, uh, scale, uh, beside interest rate cuts uh, uh, and beside uh, expansion of uh, of. Um, um, Quantitative easing. Uh, we have uh, we had uh, uh, the Fed reducing costs for swap uh, arrangements uh, between uh, major central banks, uh, uh, establishing uh, um, temporary uh, dollar liquidity arrangements uh, or swap um, uh, lines, uh, uh, and uh, etc. Uh, this, uh, in turn, however, and we have the commitment from the central banks uh, that uh, uh, they will take uh, um, the further steps. Uh, if necessary, uh, but however, this uh, means also that uh, it's not the value uh, in the credit market which is driving uh, credit risk premia. It's uh, primarily the liquidity, and this is illustrated in the next uh, uh, chart uh, where I show the correlation of uh, the uh, European high yield uh, uh, index uh, with. Uh, uh, the um, Stocks Europe uh, 600 index uh, um, uh, and uh, um, on, the on the left hand chart uh, and uh, correlation uh, with the, uh, the same uh, index with uh, Bunds um, on the one hand and similar co uh, correlation between US Treasuries and Emerging Markets SMB index and uh, MSCI index, uh, the equity index in emerging markets. And you see that uh, the, uh, the, uh, in both cases, uh, the correlation uh, of, uh, of the uh, um, bond indices uh, with uh, uh, Treasuries uh, is uh, uh, very high, close to one, uh, indicating that, uh, that uh, um, Bond, uh, bond markets liquidity are in the driving uh, seat of, uh, of um, uh, credit market uh, at this uh, stage. Um, last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, um, highlight uh, uh, a third uh, risk factor, uh, which uh, we see um, uh, in, the, in the pipeline uh, reigning uh, credit markets, uh, in particular the emerging markets, uh, and this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, US-Chinese uh, uh, tensions uh, and uh, related uh, risk uh, of uh, economic sanctions. Uh, um, uh, in the chart you see the um, market capital, ca capitalization of uh, the Chinese and Hong Kong uh, components uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, JP Morgan SEMBI index. Uh, in uh, major markets, in developed markets, uh, uh, indices like IBOX, uh, Chinese corporates play 
a very minor uh, role. But in emerging markets corporate index, uh, indices, uh, uh, they play a very significant role, given the fact that uh, Chinese uh, corporates, both banks and, uh, and the non-financials, used to be over the past decade uh, very frequent um, uh, issuers uh, in, in emerging markets and actually the primary market currently is or over the past few day, a few years is uh, uh, dominated by Chinese uh, corporates. Uh, and you see that while um, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, corporates uh, dominate, uh, had a very uh, significant uh, share uh, um, reaching 25% of the, of the index, uh, uh, it is now the uh, the mainland uh, Chinese uh, corporates. Uh, in, uh, and uh, why I am highlighting this, uh, basically um, uh, economic uh, sanctions uh, used to be uh, over the past decades a frequent is instrument of uh, uh, US foreign policy. And uh, um, we saw it in the case of uh, 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 Russia, uh, related to Krim crisis, we saw it in uh, with respect to uh, um, to to Iran, uh, Venezuela, etc. And um, uh, this time uh, couldn't be uh, different. Uh, imagine that uh, the U.S. Um, uh, starts to sanction um, Chinese corporates. Uh, let's uh, put uh, two or three uh, banks. Uh, uh, or non-financial corporates uh, uh, and cuts it uh, in extreme case uh, out of the um, uh, US dollar uh, financial in infrastructure. Uh, we had a precedence case uh, uh, a few years ago with the case of Rusal, the Russian uh, aluminium uh, uh, company, which has been for almost one year cut off, uh, put on sanction list and cut off of the uh, of the US dollar infrastructure. To my knowledge, it was uh, uh, the, uh, the only major uh, Eurobond issuer um, uh, cut, uh, which faced this kind of sanctions. The company, even if it had uh, uh, dollars to transfer to its uh, creditors, it couldn't transfer because every uh, dollar uh, transaction needs to go through uh, US uh, correspondent banks. Uh, uh, this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, this risk uh, factor is not completely out of uh, out of cards. Uh, um, last year, in the first half of the uh, of the last year, um, the U.S. Uh, uh, um, administration uh, sued uh, in the court uh, uh, in Washington three Chinese banks, uh, and the court actually uh, authorized uh, the Treasury to impose economic sanctions against. Uh, uh, three uh, banks uh, for breaching uh, for breaching uh, uh, sanctions against uh, Iran. Uh, san um, sanctions have not been implemented. Nonetheless, a precedence case has been uh, has been uh, has been made. And uh, if you uh, when you observe uh, the dynamics in the uh, tensions between the two two countries there is a clear risk uh, uh, that uh, this kind of sanctions might be imposed. And if you imagine that a um, uh, few banks or, or corporates uh, uh, will be put on sanctions and take into account that uh, um, uh, a large part of the Chinese component of the, uh, of the indices are uh, investment grade rated uh, corporates, which attracted a lot of uh, not only emerging markets dedicated investors but also many crossover uh, investors which were looking uh, for investment in this asset class for pickup looking for investment grade uh, uh, with a certain yield pickup these investors will will be will be spooked and leave the market uh, very quickly uh, so in the, uh, i think that this is a, a, a risk factor beyond the growth related uh, um, uh, growth related uh, uh, risk risk uh, um, uh, significant uh, sec, uh, risk factor which needs to be monitored and uh, we might see more uh, in this uh, uh, respect uh, when we approach the uh, the us elections that's all for my side at this stage and happy to answer um, uh, questions from the from the um, uh, audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan, uh, for very interesting uh, 
presentation. Actually, I picked a few um, questions from the audience and uh, actually from my side, uh, well, yeah, you mentioned uh, all these sanctions, which is uh, could be actually applied. I don't think it's a good idea in, in this timing. Uh, but, well, the first question is, uh, how will 9% uh, default rates, which you have mentioned, expected to behave in terms of some particular uh, sector uh, distribution? Should it be more concentrated in some particular uh, sectors and um, uh, if we compare uh, to the previous crises? Well, I think that uh, uh, obviously one sector stands out in uh, in uh, in this crisis, and it's uh, travel and leisure. Um, and this sector uh, didn't recover uh, fully; uh, was a major recover. And this is the sector which, uh, where the visibility is extremely low, and we might see um, uh, we might see there uh, also uh, defaults. I would say um, other sectors, and this is also a a sector which employs, uh, 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 which is not that systematically uh, uh, rele relevant to governments, uh, as is the case uh, uh, automobiles and, uh, for instance, uh, uh, or basic resources, which are much more uh, systematically re uh, relevant, or utilities, which are in a better position to um, uh, to uh, to receive uh, support uh, from uh, from governments. So this is the, a major, a major, a major um, uh, candidate for see to see um, uh, defaults. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, um, uh, extend it uh, only on the, on the sector base. But uh, also, I would at this stage uh, uh, avoid uh, um, credits uh, which are below a double B rated uh, uh, corporates uh, against mm -hmm. this. Drop. Understood. And uh, well, even from my side, uh, I had a question which corresponds basically to the questions from the chat. Um, so let's talk about uh, probably the risk premium. What kind of pricing do you expect uh, right now? Because um, uh, the risk is uh, increasing and uh, premium is rather low. So rather big, big disconnection. What do you think uh, right now the yields should be uh, according to the risk we, we have? Well, I think um, uh, in our um, forecast, so we have uh, penciled uh, uh, still a, a kind of, uh, uh, for emerging markets, a slight uh, uh, compression in, in, uh, in uh, credit risk premium towards the end of the year. Um, nothing dramatic. We saw already a large part of the compression. Uh, this is to large part um, uh, priced in, and for the uh, in, in uh, Western Europe uh, on on iBooks basis, uh, we expect a pretty uh, flat uh, uh, performance. Uh, uh, no major. Uh, um, spread compression. Uh, the good news is uh, basically uh, to large part uh, priced in. For the moment, we don't expect uh, um, uh, any uh, significant uh, uh, spread compression, neither in emerging markets nor in uh, Western European uh, corporates. Okay. And probably the last question, because we are more or less uh, uh, should be in the in the timing. Uh, so you you had the, the slide with uh, different uh, markets. Uh, so I just wanted to um, uh, for you to ask the question: What kind of markets now correspond better uh, to the uh, activities of uh, the central banks? How stable these markets are? So you mentioned uh, Italy; they rather suffered this. Um, well, Germany uh, also. So. Well, I, I, I would uh, focus on markets uh, with strong governments. Uh, uh, this is the time when uh, uh, governments uh, come into, into play and you observe uh, uh, a very strong uh, role uh, of uh, governments across the globe. But a government can afford, um, uh, we need to di differentiate uh, between um, governments and between the availability of uh, of means uh, and uh, we are less concerned with uh, in terms of eurozone uh, you see that uh, 
the, uh, even um, uh, on the EU scale, uh, the EU is going to uh, to issue bonds uh, and uh, to support uh, uh, the economy. And there is a, a sharing of risk uh, uh, going forward. Um, uh, in uh, in emerging Europe, uh, um, uh, Russian uh, government certainly has the means uh, to uh, to support. Uh, um, systematically uh, relevant uh, uh, corporates uh, and some, this is something which uh, uh, the government already did uh, in 2008-2009 and also in the Crimea um, crisis. Uh, uh, so um, I would focus on sectors which are systematically uh, relevant, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, cyclicalities uh, of second, uh, secondary importance, uh, but the closeness of uh, to the government. It's uh, it's uh, and this is the uh, large banks, uh, uh, basic resources, oil and gas, uh, uh, utilities. These are the sectors which are uh, traditionally close to governments, uh, and uh, and uh, I would focus on these. Have pretty similar idea. All right, and the uh, promise of the last question. But since you are from the uh, Germany Eurozone, and uh, just to finalize, so what are kind of your expectations of the inflation in Euro uh, area uh, we can expect in this, uh, the end of uh, this year and probably 21? Well, inflation is not going to be a problem in foreseeable future. Uh, we are, uh, despite uh, uh, the fact uh, that uh, um, we are witnessing with a, a massive uh, flood of uh, liquidity from uh, central banks uh, and uh, governments are borrowing, uh, um, uh, inflation is a big conundrum. Uh, even uh, central banks are um, uh, asking the, the question, why do we not see um, uh, inflation, uh, given the measures uh, we saw, this is not not only now, uh, already after the uh, two thousand eight two thousand nine crisis, uh, but uh, there are a number of factors uh, which are uh, exerting uh, deflationary forces. Actually, um, look at the uh, dynamics, uh, uh, population dynamics, particularly in major economies, which are uh, uh, we we are coping with shrinking populations. Uh, uh, this is uh, exerting uh, less inflationary or deflationary um, uh, pressure. Um, look at the uh, scale of uh, robotics and uh, automatization, artificial intelligence, which is exerti exerting uh, uh, um, uh, deflationary uh, pressure on the, uh, or less inf uh, Pressure on the on on wages, uh, um, and last but not least, uh, the um, transformation of the economy uh, out of the uh, fossils uh, uh, to the uh, uh, data-driven economy, uh, which is and uh, e-mobility, which is also uh, reducing uh, pressure uh, on 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 inflation. So we are uh, we we are coping with uh, with the long-term. Uh, factors which are limiting uh, upside pressure in inflation and uh, I think that uh, despite these uh, these uh, uh, measures inflation is not going to be uh, to be a problem in the, in the next uh, okay. few years. Thank you very much Stefan for joining us today. Thank you for having uh, and answering all our questions. Uh, then I'm passing the floor to our next uh, speaker, and I would like to ask uh, to join our uh, next speaker, Nicholas Kramer. Uh, he's the head of uh, ratings uh, performance analytics uh, in s and uh, Well, I should say Nick is uh, uh, working with the SAP for about uh, 16 years, and uh, for the last uh, 13 years, he has been the main uh, one of uh, the main people in the core uh, team of the research. Um, stay here. Uh, so uh, his um, uh, his researches and forecasts are uh, very insightful. Uh, so today, uh, let's speak more about um, the. Uh, rating side, because you are basically uh, doing all the evaluations and tell us about all the risks. So, Nick, uh, you can start, please. Okay, great. Thank you, Lana. 
And thanks everyone for uh, for having me here. Hope that this meets everyone in healthy, uh, safe circumstances, given everything that's been going on um, from the U.S. end over here. I don't think we expected to be working from home uh, quite this long. I already have had to set up a gym for myself behind me here. Um, but uh, so as, as Stefan really uh, teed this up well, um, there's a lot of similarities that you'll see in terms of uh, what we're seeing. I'll get a little bit more into the, uh, the details within the spec rate component um, for the US, uh, or rather the corporate uh, default rate forecast. And a lot of the same uh, trends are being seen elsewhere, um, primarily the US. There's a lot of similarities in the way that ratings are behaving and migrating in a lot of ways in which the markets are reacting um, on both sides of the Atlantic. So I think we had a poll question we um, wanted to start with just to get everyone involved here, but just to uh, put it out there. So before diving into it, um, where do you think the European speculative grade corporate default rate will be by a year from now, roughly June 2021? So I've got a quite a wide range here where it could fall to 3%. Right now, uh, as we measure it, it's about 3.4% through June of 2020. And then obviously 3% increments from here. Um, I should state, you know, before going into uh, most of this, what I'll be presenting generally, uh, almost entirely, the way we look at uh, defaults and default rates as, is on an issuer, an equally weighted issuer basis. So this will be by issuer credit ratings rather than outstanding debt. Uh, you'll find often, of course, for obvious reasons, if you have a debt-based rate, that it can tend to fluctuate quite a bit more if you have a uh, particularly large or maybe a period of smaller defaults. It can, it can fluctuate a bit more there. So I'll give you some time there to answer that. Um, and just to introduce myself and the group, uh, the research group that I work with, we uh, generally, I've, I've been in the research end for uh, close to 14 years now with S&P and focus on mostly on corporate uh, uh, markets, but we also cover structured finance, public finance, and uh, we're the ones who do a lot of the default and transition studies, um, as well as the uh, default forecasts. We look at issuance and issuance trends globally and forecast that, um, rating action trends, and within research also is our, our economics team. So maybe just jump in here to the next slide, if I could. Um, perfect, okay. <laughs> so, all right, to start with, here's what our projections are. So what we're, where we expect defaults uh, to fall, spec grade defaults within Europe uh, over the next 12 months, this is through March of, of 21. We're currently updating the, uh, the projection through June. Um, but obviously a few things to notice here and the biggest being that very wide range in possibilities between the pessimistic and the optimistic. Normally it's, it's never, never that wide. It, it might be a percentage point or two in either direction. And um, obviously from, from what you can see in the post crisis, post financial crisis timeframe, the default rate has generally held at roughly 2%. And I think it's been on average 2% uh, for the last seven years or so. Now, that to me seems unbelievable, um, especially considering there was a recession after the financial crisis. And as you can see, the, the peak, if you can call it that, afterwards was only about 3.5% uh, towards early, uh, really into 2013 there. We're about at that level now. So even with the optimistic scenario of about 3.5%, that still takes us to about that peak level in 2013. The base case, of course, is much higher um, at 8.5%. And, a percent. and I, those are, that's the distinction that I will focus on most of, of you know, the rest of this analysis. The, the pessimistic scenario is honestly taking our ratings mix, which has deteriorated quite a bit, um, over the last several years, but in particular in the first six months of 2020, and stressing that a little bit further with some basic economic assumptions behind that. Um, our economists have updated their forecasts for the Eurozone um, for it back in, in June. Their most recent wasn't much different than what they had produced prior to that. So it's about a, 
a 7.8% uh, decline in GDP for 2020. That was revised down slightly, but mostly just because of the deeper decline in Q2 uh, than was pro previously expected. And for uh, 2021, they're expecting a rebound, I think like many, but it's, it's going to be slow and drawn out. And even though it'll be about a 5.5% um, increase, getting back to the 2019 levels of economic output, and as I'll show later, the, the, the same corresponding levels of credit risk is going, to take, is going to be a several years process. And this is what we're seeing uh, globally as well. Um, so the, really to think about these scenarios is almost not being scenarios on one story, but because of this wide range and the way I think of it is, is really uh, multiple outcomes really. And, and, and what it'll depend on is a lot of uncertainty going forward. So in the base case, um, what's driving some of that? Well, eight and a half percent, as we saw, was going to be quite a bit higher than, than what we have seen in the past. And a lot of this is, is looking at the credit degradation of, again, the last few years. So the top chart on the left, uh, what I'm showing is the, again, the issuer count of our spec grade uh, population in Europe over time. And obviously there's been a, a big increase in, in market penetration and, and issuers coming uh, maybe some migrating from credit estimates, which we don't include, to, um, to the long-term ratings here around 2009, 2010, the post-crisis period. But this has also been growing at a faster clip <clears throat> than in the U.S. Uh, for the last several years. So now we're up just above 700, around 725. Conversely, in the U.S., we're probably looking at a close to 1,900 spec grade issuers. So it's a much <clears throat> excuse me, deeper market but the growth is, is much uh, greater in Europe. The, the lines there are, we're just looking at the proportion of the total that is B minus and below the dark line. And just looking, of course, at the highest risk there, the triple C segment. Um, obviously both uh, in particular B minus and lower is at an all time high as a proportion of the total. So, and that began uh, in, the second half of 2019, where you see that increase really take off. Uh, we began the year uh, at about 22% at B minus and lower. That was an all time high and that was up quite a bit. Normally what you would see is this, this ratio to increase as defaults increase and pull um, issue, the issuer rating mix down. You'll see a decline in the, uh, the total spec rate issuer base. At the same time, you generally see uh, the increase in B minus and below, and that will often come during a recession. What we're seeing now in both regions, US and Europe, is that marked increase in B minus and below in a benign period. Uh, it's much greater in the US to be sure. Um, some of that per perhaps being just from increased demand from CLO investors, and a lot of these new issuers are, are loan funded rather than bond funded or a mix of the two. Uh, but clearly in the, in the first half of 2020, we've seen even greater degradation, now up to 32.5% B minus and below uh, at the start of the second half. Uh, and that obviously coming up uh, about 11% in just six months. So obviously that pace of, of degradation is, is truly historic. Um, in terms of triple C's too, a lot of, you know, obviously it makes sense, a lot of the representation there over half um, are among now sectors that are most vulnerable to the virus and the resultant social distancing measures. So retail, consumer products, uh, leisure, transportation. Um, but each of those sectors will represent different proportions of the total. So it depends, I think, if you're kind of the cross sector or relative value type of person, or if you're looking at this in the whole, um, the, the mix can maybe tell a, a, a deeper story. For example, healthcare and chemicals, we'll see later that that is a large portion, relatively large portion of the total spec grade uh, population that we have in Europe that we rate um, a lot of B minus and lower, but because of that sector's um, unique uh, characteristics coming in, and that does include pharmaceuticals, although I doubt there are many that are B minus, a lot more of them are unstable. So this doesn't reflect the outlooks and credit watches which we're seeing in the bottom hand, uh, chart there. 
And that we call our negative bias. Um, and that really is the percentage of outlooks and credit watches that are negative relative to the total. So it still hasn't reached the, um, the financial crisis highs for either investment grade or for spec grade, uh, but pretty close. And again, much like that deterioration in, in the ratings mix, this is happening very quickly uh, in the last couple of months and is really now up to close to 50%. There's a little bit of a trail off there. Not sure if that's going to truly become an inflection point. Um, but maybe a bit of positivity there that, of course, coincides with a little bit of positivity in the economic news uh, that we've seen in the, recent, uh, in the recent month or two. Um, so in this case, and I'm trying to remember, I know we had another uh, um, poll question for you. I don't think we have it ready just yet. I'm trying to remember. Oops, why not? We'll go to it. Oops. Okay. Cool. Sure, what we have here. Okay, we'll go back to uh, go back to this slide. Apologies there, but um, to get a to get a sense, th these charts are showing the the same uh, relationships here. So you can think of them as as really interchangeable. Um, hopefully, they're they're viewable here. Uh, I know the the font's a little bit small, but what we're trying to show on the top is a sector by sector breakout of the current spec grade population. And on the lower chart, we're looking at it by country uh, within Europe um, by our definition. And so this gives you an idea of where the coverage is as well as the credit degradation of the last 12 months. So the X axis in both cases, we were looking at the net rating action uh, rate. So this is essentially upgrade the pace of upgrades subtracting the pace of downgrades over the last 12 months. It's rare that you would see anything to the right of, of the, uh, the zero point there in the, uh, the X axis. It does happen, of course, um, but in an environment like this, not surprising that we're generally to the left of that. And this is normally a uh, Northeast Southwest type of relationship. Those, these uh, Southeast and Northwest quadrants, um, typically you don't see much happen there um, for obvious reasons. But then on the, the, the y-axis, what we have there is our forward look as measured by the bias. So this is the net bias, uh, the positive bias percent subtracting out the negative bias. Um, and it gives you an idea, of course, with the bubble size of, of the relative impact of each sector. The, the largest, as we measure it, is what we call consumer services. Um, these are large uh, conglomerations of smaller sectors that might be a little more familiar. So within consumer services, you would have consumer products, for example, and certain retailers. Within leisure uh, time and media, uh, the larger of the two large uh, bubbles towards the far lower southwest quadrant is um, where you would find uh, a lot of your gaming, hotels, uh, casinos, a lot of the interpersonal or, or out of home um, uh, media and entertainment types of uh, companies. Um, next to that, that AACGM is, is a large combination of aerospace, automotive, capital goods and metal, uh, generally because all of those sectors are very small on their own but have grown over time, certainly, um, to, to be a force there within the spec grade segment. And as I said, the, uh, the healthcare segment is the other large one there uh, to the Northeast of consumer services. That again, includes um, hospitals as well as, as pharmaceuticals and device makers, et cetera. So there are some that are a little bit different here than what you might see in the US. The presence of energy and natural resources is fairly small. It's much larger in the US and that, of course, that sector has on top of COVID, everything that's happening with the supply side in, uh, in, in recent months. Um, but that has a smaller effect on the European population as well. And of course, the one that is probably most stressed is transportation, including commercial airlines. Um, but it does have a small impact on the total portfolio relatively. And there's quite a bit of dispersion across sectors that we're seeing because of this stress, because it isn't affecting every sector in the same way. However, if we look at the geographical breakout, that is much more concentrated. And of course, the disproportionate impact of the United Kingdom on the, on the total is also noticeable. And the highlighted cell there is, is the overall. Um, this bottom chart, I say, is the 
top 10 largest uh, countries in terms of their population of spec grade um, issuers that we rate as part of the population. And they account for nearly 90% of the total. Um, and then again, if you try to combine the two, they say there, there's none that really get beyond 5% on their own, but uh, for UK and French consumer service firms, those two cross-sectional mixes come out to about 10% combined of the total and healthcare among some of the larger countries, including France and Germany, uh, Luxembourg, I believe as well, and Netherlands, um, it does also constitute a large uh, chunk of both the sector and, and the geographical breakout here. So for the next slide, this, this gives you a snapshot, but where does this rank over time? And where does the momentum come from and where has it been relatively? So we take the, the prior chart and just look, track the total spec grade population over time. And we can see that the, the pace of credit degradation and the actual, uh, the amount is now around where we were in the, uh, the financial crisis. In fact, the downgrade rate uh, is at a highest point ever at about negative, a net negative 25%. And the net bias is pretty close to the all time low, I should say, uh, that we're seeing during uh, the 2009 period. Now, this does not include defaults, downgrades to default. I should have prefaced it that way. But it, to capture the momentum effect that we, we of course, see often downgrades tend to precede defaults. Uh, once you see a, a spike up in triple Cs, for example, that obviously is another good indicator of where we're going forward. And this all comes into the, uh, the base case. Again, the credit metrics are showing based on history, a relative decline close to the, that eight and a half, nine percent um, default rate. I've highlighted two periods there that the first circle close to where we are now, the highlighted point, of course, is through 2000, or second quarter of 2020. Very close to that, that is the, the peak default rate point in 2009. So that's Q4 2009 there. And you can see there is that turnaround, that, that rebound, that, that slowing of downgrades that leads to the default rate peak. So there is always that lag in there. And some of that is the default rate itself is a lagged indicator. It's trailing 12 months. Um, now that little spike again is way up close to that clustering that, that where most of these observations are for Q4 of 2013. And you can see the, the cyclical behaviors does still follow the same general pattern. There's a little bit more of a lead time. Again, that isn't a true cyclical peak in, in the traditional sense. Um, but it really puts into context how this pattern, even in, in benign times, does seem to cycle through. Um, if we were to look at uh, the lower uh, chart, this is something we look at weekly. Um, and these are weekly uh, rating actions since COVID. We call it the flattening of the rating action curve, um, thankfully, at least so far. And, and it really outside after the first week of May, you see a marked drop off in the number of both downgrades and negative outlook or credit watch changes in Europe. Um, we're not quite down to the pre COVID level, but pretty close, at least for now. And there's some blips here and there. Um, but what I'm trying to emphasize there is that that point in the top chart does look very bad. And of course it is, but most of what's bringing it down is the April for Q2, the April experience. And if we were to look at it on a monthly basis and break it out, we might be seeing that that turnaround, at least in the uh, the rating actions uh, proportion, the, the X axis there. And if we most of these rating actions that we have taken have been on speculative grade credits. And if we were to exclude financial services and sovereigns, this rises up to almost three quarters. So and I give you a little breakout of the sectors most represented here on an uh, on a count basis. So capital goods was, was up there at the highest, uh, followed of course by retail, media and entertainment. Uh, Nick, before we move forward, so let's, um, you already made the sneak peek of the results, but let's check what, uh, what is the result of the first survey. So what is uh, the expectation? So let's see. Uh, so probably 6% uh, percent is more on dominates the expectations, if you see it. Okay. 
All right, so that's interesting. We do. Do you have some takers on the on three percent there, um, <laughs> which is interesting? But uh, okay, so, so between six and nine percent, we'll say the majority uh, came in. All right, so that's um, somewhat expected. And so the reason I uh, wanted to put that out there is as we get into the optimistic scenario, um, it seems that there may be more of these three percent takers than uh, than uh, the survey would suggest. So. Um, so if we could jump back into here. All right. Um, which one is next here now? Do we, we can launch probably the second question if you want. Oh. And I think we have, uh, we had a second poll. There we go. Okay. So before we get into the optimistic scenario, I suppose is, is a key question. Um, what we've seen so far from central banks across the world, uh, the ECB has, has really been, uh, has made multiple steps, um, as, as has the Fed, in terms of supporting liquidity. So what is the general thinking of where central banks will move monetary policy over the next 12 months to a looser, a tighter stance or uh, no substantive change? And I'm including that the liquidity facilities such as the PEPP. Um, certainly in the feds in particular, their uh, primary and secondary corporate bond purchasing programs. So with that uh, gives some time there for people to, uh, to respond. But um, again, this is, uh, this is potentially a very key question um, moving forward um, in terms of providing this liquidity. Should we get a second wave? Um, that, of course, is a, is a possibility or more than likely what we're seeing again with the economic forecast that the recovery may take longer than initially expected. Um, we are, it seems to be most are saying, but certainly our economists that we are out of the recession and that the rebound will be beginning in this quarter, again, just very slow and it'll be several years before we get back to the actual level of output um, seen at the end of 2019, so. Let's just uh, maybe jump ahead now, if we could. Great. All right. Oops. Okay. So yeah, we might as well go over it. Okay. So some. Uh, so it's either looser or or no change. Okay. That's that's generally my own opinion where I, th I think things are going, and it may again, if it's looser, it it, it might be heavily dependent on. Uh, how the virus uh, plays out again with second waves um, and, and again with uh, fiscal responses too. I didn't include fiscal in that. So um, that could be a determining factor as well. So good. Great. Okay. So, so again, the, the base case was covering what we're seeing in the credit side. And again, along with the economic recovery, the belief uh, certainly is that, and it depends on the sector that um, recovery of credit metrics will take several years uh, to correct themselves from where we are now to get back to the 2019 levels, uh, which again, in many sectors, we're looking at heightened debt levels, uh, stressed uh, debt to EBITDA and et cetera. But optimistic case, normally now, of course, when we look at the forecasts, we always incorporate economic variables, the credit variables and, and where market pricing is coming in. And again, normally this does not produce a wide uh, range of outcomes that we're forecasting right now. And I don't envision that to change uh, with the June update either. I think we're still seeing a lot of what we're seeing here. Um, credit metrics haven't improved and market pricing has continued to come back in. Um, in terms of debt issuance, uh, it, there was a lull there clearly, as we can see from the top chart in March, April and really most of May. Um, June and July have been fairly healthy. I'm not showing July here, but uh, definitely on the leveraged loan side, we're seeing about as much volume around seven to eight billion uh, euros as we did in, in June. So that's been coming back at a stable level. And now we're year to date above the combined issuance of high yield bonds and leveraged loans where we were in 2019. Second half of 19 was particularly strong um, in both the US and Europe in this regard. So we may not come in uh, full year uh, to 2019, although it could be possible. But the bigger thing there and is the bottom hand chart where we look at the default rate typically uh, led 
by um, by where market pricing is, and that can be a, roughly a year or so uh, lead time. And this is the high yield spread um, on bonds uh, from J.P. Morgan, as well as the um, our European leverage loan spread to maturity uh, from our colleagues at LCD, and and. Similar to that Outlook Credit Watch and, and the degradation in, in the ratings mix, you can see that obviously spreads spiked uh, really at, at that 90 degree angle almost in the same way, uh, but they have been coming back down. And, and that has been generally, uh, there have been plateaus here and there since, since March uh, on the downward trajectory, but it hasn't really reversed itself. Um, and why would that be if we're seeing credit metrics deteriorate as much as we have? Um, there's some positivity that can be obviously taken from central bank actions and fiscal supports, providing liquidity, providing funding in, in some cases, um, but as well as positive news um, on the medical front, which we can't measure through traditional economic variables, um, such as GDP, such as industrial production, for example. But markets can certainly reflect optimism, at least in thinking, um, as we get what I would argue so far has generally been a series of encouraging news in terms of vaccine development and, and treatments as well for those who are already ill, uh, which may reduce death rates. And certainly a vaccine would, would be a, a groundbreaking uh, event in terms of positivity for, for you know, the world. Um, so that that's, these factors are part of it. There may be some technical ones as well, but it is surprising to see uh, where spreads are coming. And if we look at the historical relationship that generally comes out to that three and a half percent. So I'll just, in the interest of time, jump ahead and just maybe question that, that conclusion with the optimistic case and where markets uh, could be. Are they showing too much optimism? We include this uh, for the US, uh, we do one for Europe, obviously here that we're showing is our estimated spread and we track that against the actual high yield spread. And normally I always say this is this should be a boring chart. The only time that we've seen marked divergences is when the actual spread was above uh, the estimate. And that made, makes sense there at the peak of the financial crisis that indeed the worst was generally over um, in the fundamental case and you saw a, a a gap there in spreads. We're not presenting this as a fair value uh, model per se, or to make any call on when it's time to jump into the, the high yield market or get out of it. Um, it. It isn't intended to be any kind of investment advice, but what we're trying to capture uh, because the fit is so tight, really when are markets out of sync with fundamentals and when can that be a warning sign? In the US, we've seen that in the lead up to the crisis. Uh, we don't see that here in, in, in European comparison, but in, uh, in recent months, and it's really been uh, since late 2018, 2019, once the trade conflict started picking up steam, uh, that the estimate was starting to get above the actual in both regions. Once we got to February, when COVID hit, um, this difference jumped up to an average of 4.8%. Um, with peak, I believe in March, uh, which was almost five and a half percent there. Now they are moving in tandem. They are moving parallel to each other. The estimated spread based on economic and mar financial market variables um, and, and money supply is coming back down, but that gap persists. Um, if that's the case, obviously, if we were to plug this in as an estimate, uh, that would raise the default rate up uh, a bit, maybe not to the eight and a half percent but it's certainly much higher than where markets are pricing things. So I'll just uh, quickly go through, and this is mostly talking points. Again, the pessimistic case, resumption of the virus, deeper economic impact, longer social distancing measures and lockdowns, um, obviously limiting uh, revenue. The main, main driver of the deteriorating credit metrics is the lack of revenue um, because of how to contain the virus. And again, that affecting certain sectors more than others. So that that's at the core of the pessimistic case. And really what we're doing there is, is looking back, not, not to that 2011 to 2013 uh, recession, but to the financial crisis at, at the very least and stressing our portfolio um, a bit more than what we saw there. Uh, that comes out to roughly that 11 and a half percent. And the bigger question too now again is timing. And this is this is potentially key. And this comes into 
play with fiscal and uh, monetary um, assistance, does this prevent defaults? Uh, does this, it doesn't prevent credit deterioration. Um, a lot of what's making firms survive as long as they have is debt. And this debt uh, will likely be with us for quite some time. When the supports eventually fade, um, where will debt be for these corporations at that time? Will, it, will they wait to remove those, those supports until corporate debt comes down? Or are they strictly looking at things from an unemployment and uh, Main Street impact? And if that's the case, we, if we have debt extended for a long period of time, might we see a protracted uh, plateau rather than a cyclical peak in defaults moving forward? And that's definitely a possibility um, as we see it. And just to tie it in, I, I had mentioned this, the longer term perspective from the credit uh, side. And this is uh, from a recent uh, research piece that our um, analytical teams did where they did a global sweep and broke it out by region, looking at what, what is specific to each region for the corporate portfolio. Um, it's not, this isn't a one size fits all, but I've, we focused on EMEA, of course, for the purposes of this presentation, but you can see the majority aren't believed to be back to that 2019 credit metrics um, levels. And again, that's generally EBITDA, uh, revenue, um, outstanding debt uh, till about 2022. So we have another year and a half of, of recovery for most sectors and some are going to go beyond 2023 as well. Um, just a handful, but very few have seen any deterioration at all. Um, so this is going to be an ongoing question. Again, that peak versus plateau potential. So I'm going to leave it there and take any questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I could listen to you for hours. Definitely, it's, uh, it was a really interesting uh, forecast for the next uh, uh, years. Uh, uh, we are uh, actually a bit out of uh, our schedule, so I would be rather fast. And uh, actually, uh, so you mentioned uh, some markets, and just recently, a few days ago, I was reading uh, some forecasts from Fitch, for instance. They made uh, the forecast that uh, in Latin America there would be lots of bankruptcies. So, as of uh, Europe, um, uh, where do you expect maybe there would uh, would there be maybe some effect of uh, domino uh, kind of like bankruptcies from uh, the corporates which um, market could suffer more and maybe which um, um, sectors as well okay there we go um i think it to, to even you know what what stefan mentioned was was obviously the media and entertainment the uh the point of service or the out of the house um, entertainment, media, transportation. Again, that uh, transportation was pushed out there in that last chart to 2022, 2023. That's, that's obviously a long time to go. And with the ratings mix, what it is. Um, however, most of the defaults, I don't think we've seen a single bankruptcy yet this year, at least in our population. Uh, and we anticipated most of the defaults in the near term to be either distressed exchanges or selective defaults, missed interest payments, um, assuming, depending on what your assumptions are of how long this will go on, will many of these companies be solvent um, over the next six months? Do they just need to get past an initial window until a vaccine is made available um, and, of course, globally deployed? Um, again, that assumption will probably come under some greater stress uh, as time goes on. It t tends to be most of these forecasts start getting revised downward. Um, the economic one already did just a little bit, but that, that is still the direction. So that the longer this goes on, the more insolvent companies uh, will likely become, particularly if liquidity and fiscal support start to fade, um, which again, you know, it, it becomes an expensive endeavor for, for the sovereigns at that point. All right, Nick, thank you very much for your presentation and for your outlook. I was really anticipating your uh, insights and hope uh, our listeners also um, caught some ideas from your uh, analysis. Thank you. Then uh, we are passing thank to a more practical uh, section. Uh, we should probably uh, go faster. <laughs> Uh, then, uh, so uh, I would like to pass uh, to more practical uh, uh, side. Basically, we'll have uh, the interview with um, uh, our portfolio managers. Uh, uh, the first one who 
example, um, you know, who I'm passing the floor is uh, Andres, Andres Schwin. He's uh, as chief investment uh, officer and uh, head of portfolio management at uh, Giant Swiss Consulting. Well, uh, we know uh, each other for a while, and uh, he's uh, CEO uh, Oscar. Um, and well, basically, they started as uh, just um, asset management company, um, uh, Switzerland licensed. Uh, uh, but now, as uh, they are on my radar, um, I just noticed that uh, they are now launched a digital uh, web, uh, wealth management service uh, company. So they are providing their license with uh, different investment proposals uh, according to their risk profile and do it uh, rather well. Uh, so I just want to ask um, Andres, uh, basically you just recently uh, launched your new digital uh, wealth management uh, company. So can you comment how basically you digitalize your uh, risk evaluation? What do you do uh, in terms of your portfolio management right now? Because the performance of it is rather high in terms of the yield. Um, and what kind of uh, advantages uh, your clients uh, get? What kind of uh, best investment ideas uh, you can share with us right now? Okay, thank you, uh, Lana, very much for this introduction. Um, hello to everybody. Thanks for having me. And um, all right, uh, as, as you hear, so I got a, quite a big task today and uh, give some <laughs> good investment ideas to the audience. Um, now, of course, you understand, um, I'll, I'll gladly share uh, what we do and how we do this. And um, But of course, um, with respect um, to um, everybody's individual situation, I'm sure you understand this is not an official investment recommendation. Um, so this is mostly sharing best practice of, of, of how we operate and, and what we do in today's world when we try to invest uh, funds and, and assets from our clients into international uh, bond markets. Right, so um, as um, you, you pointed out, um, we are a Swiss company, a, a boutique asset management company. We are independent, so we're not owned by a, a large financial group, and uh, we're not taking or making money um, by any product uh, providers, uh, only paid by our clients, so that means we are, uh, as a matter of fact, able to build our own opinion about markets and uh, um, yeah, choose best suitable investment solutions for our clients. Um, I'm going to move a bit on, and I just want to follow up with what we heard from Stefan and Nick already. Um, these are risk factors you see in the slide. You all know uh, when you're um, trying to compose a bond portfolio uh, these days. And now, adding to what they just said, we have COVID-19 as the additional um, risk, but also potential uh, return um, driver for uh, bond portfolios. So that makes, um, of course, my and my fellow's job uh, even more complicated since we deal, need to deal with the additional component of uh, uncertainty. Um, right. Rather than talking about um, how our portfolios look these days, that's probably something which would be very boring for the audience. I suggest we do this a bit more interactive and then do some sort of a real life um, example on, on how we try to find bonds which could fit into our portfolio search, which just could be uh, appealing in the market. That all said, I mean, Let's take a quick step back and recap where the market uh, currently is. So what you see in the slide uh, here is the selection of uh, bond market indices, uh, thanks to C-bonds, uh, where you see the evolution of yield to maturity of, of different segments of, of US dollar bond markets. I took a segment from emerging markets, but essentially you could take any market you want or any market segment you want, you'd see the same picture. There's essentially two messages in here. The first is um, if you look on the right hand side of each individual graph, you see yields are extremely low. Some segments, as you see on the left hand side uh, for the investment grade spectrum, today yields are even lower as what we had um, 
before the um, COVID-19 breakout. And um, yeah, that's the world we live in. So um, when we compose portfolios for investors, whether we like it or not, we need to take some sort of risk in order to uh, achieve return targets. And um, as my previous speakers have already mentioned, the risk factors, they're not getting less. So my job is now um, paying even more attention to what uh, potential risk factors are around. Right, Lana, um, I prepared a, a quick uh, bond search on C-Bonds. Can we show that to the audience? Yes, yes, just give me a second. <laughs> I will share the screen. I just duplicated it, so let me see the results. Right, until we get there, let me quickly tell the uh, audience. So what, what, what we're doing now is um, looking at the selection of US dollar uh, corporate bonds. And with that, I wanna give you a bit of an idea as how we, uh, um, as, or I as a portfolio manager, try to figure out where could be potentially attractive investment areas in the market and which corners of the market are eventually to be avoided. I'm sorry for interrupting, Lana. You are sharing the screen with the, our webinar, not Seabon's website. Do you see I'm perfect right now? Yes, we can see C bonds, thank you. Okay, yeah. I just applied the filters which you had. So basically uh some corporates in USD with um, yields from four uh, to to eight with mid duration three five, uh with S P rating uh double B minus up to AAA. And we excluded a few bonds, so let me uh, probably visualize it. Yeah. That looks absolutely great. So can I quickly add a quick comment on the search parameters? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, do you see them uh, up, up front? Right, right. So let me quickly um, follow up on the search parameters Lara, um, Lana just mentioned. I mean, we made some sort, we, we must make the universe um, a bit smaller. So I, I focus on durations um from uh, three to five years this is co uh, absolutely random i mean i'm not saying you must only buy bonds with three to five years duration could also be 10 years this is just for, to make the universe a bit smaller and uh to have a, have a better overview um I mean, but there's no specific reason behind you must be between duration bracket of three to five years uh secondly what, what i said is important um rating the constraints and we hear that uh, in between the lines from our previous speakers already, and I fully share that view, I don't want to go below ratings with the double B, right? So double B, as by the ratings agency's language, is uh, a speculative grade. That's something we need to accept when we want to browse for some yield, uh, but we don't want to go below that. So that's why I deliberately choose the double B minus as a lower rating bracket here. Um, the third criteria I said, go for yield between four to 8%. So why four to 8%? Now, as we all know, a US dollar risk-free rate uh, across the, the yield curve is essentially zero today. So imagine if, if uh, a credit is gonna pay 4% uh, higher than that, that implies it's quite a bit of risk already. We know we have to deal with that as what I showed via the yield evolution from the previous slide. That's how where the market is. And there's no such thing as coming around that. We would love uh, to have the, to, to this figure to be even higher, but that's unfortunately not possible. 
So why do we close the bracket uh, at 8%? Um, of course, if you leave it open, you'd see outliers. These are mostly individual companies with severe specific troubles. Um, that's not the part of this exercise. We're not interested in those. So that's why uh, we're going to leave those 8% uh, as an operating bracket. And now, as uh, Lana is already playing around, um, we see some of the names in here. Let me quickly tell you what the graph displays. On the X axis underneath, you see duration. So the, more, the longer the lifetime of the bond, the more it goes to the right. And the Y axis displays the yield. So the, the more further north it goes, uh, the higher the yield. So essentially, what would be attractive to us is to have short duration and high yield, of course. But then again, bear in mind this um, duration bracket three to five year is rather short in general. Um, this is just a snapshot of the full yield curve uh, at the short end. Anyway, um, if you browse to some of these names on the left top end, Lana, mm -hmm. you're going to see some names. And most of these ne credit names or I can tell you is because I did the ranking of those um, the bonds in, in Excel, like the 20, the, no, the first 20 bonds, they're all from sectors or industries which are deeply affected by uh, COVID-19. So this is almost without exception, these are bonds from either real estate, and with real estate, I mean either real estate development or um, commercial real estate, but not residential real estate. So those companies which will be most affected if uh, office spaces in larger cities will be uh, vacant for longer. Then we have oil companies, mostly exploration companies, which are soon, which are facing the future of lower oil prices. Of course, we know oil has oil price of oil has somewhat recovered most recently. Um, but nonetheless, uh, demand for oil is probably going to be low for longer. And then the third group is leisure companies, and these are mostly hotel um, operators or uh, other uh, conglomerates in, in leisure. Transport is another segment, airlines, flight lease, etc., etc. So you see, these are essentially all industry groups uh, and sectors which we're not too keen on having exposure given the very high level of uncertainty we do have right now. And again, of course, in a context of a full portfolio, it's all about allocation. Having some allocation to these mostly affected sectors is not something which uh, must be avoided at any price. But nonetheless, for this exercise here, um, we don't want to have uh, exposure to sectors which are mo uh, most heavily exposed uh, to COVID-19 downturns. Then tell us what you can choose. <laughs> <laughs> you pointed to the question. Thank you, Ilana. Um, I spotted a specific bond, and which and now I quickly need to check my notes here, which has a duration of uh, 3.45 and the yield of 4.9%. Uh, and it's from Nova Chemicals. Uh, do you think you find that, Lana? Mm, I believe I found it here. Yeah. That's the one, exactly. Yeah. That's the one. So what we have in here, without even knowing what this company does at this point uh, of time, right? We have found uh, a double B rated corporate bond with the around about four years lifetime remaining and the uh, yield of almost 5%, right? If you could quickly display us the chart um, of the yield over, let's say, since the beginning of the year, or let's do one year, sorry. Mm, I'm showing it right now. Do you see it? Can you do one year time frame? Um, one year, sure. Here it is. Right. So you see, fairly interesting that. The level we have today is essentially 
pretty much the, the level we had before the company. So that's a, somehow a bit of a contradiction to what we've seen in the general market development I showed on my previous slide, where you saw that most parts of the market actually traded even lower spreads than um, before the breakout of COVID. So that's definitely an add-on or to this bond, which could make it potentially attractive, given the fact the yield level is not yet, at least on the record low level. Um, can you browse up again to the description of the company? Uh, yeah, hold on. Let me go to the bonds page. Uh, sorry, Ishkia page. Okay. So, until now, we have only seen the name of the company. We've got no clue what the company actually does, right? Uh, why not? So, let's go to the description. So, uh, they do plastic and chemicals. Uh, uh, we have some rating uh, story. Basically, <laughs> that would be one of the interesting things to see. Well, it's not that bad. And let's see. Very good. A few bonds, so actually, kind of like this is not probably the the highest yield, but in short term, yeah. That's absolutely right. That's a very good point. So this is not the highest yield on earth, but what could be interesting for me, and of course I did a bit of background check uh, before that exercise. Is, so this is apparently a company from a cyclical industry. So this is a chemical company, right? On the other hand, it's not uh, really obvious or apparent if, if um, they have a dramatic uh, impact from COVID-19 on, on their sales. So as a matter of fact, and now I'm adding a bit of background information, they produce plastic components, which are used for packaging, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's proven over the last years that demand for this type of goods is fairly stable. Secondly, uh, the chemical industry uses is uh, the most uh, or one of the biggest um, cost drivers is oil prices. So if oil prices are essentially rather on the way down than up, this is eventually even a good thing for a company like that. Third point was, as we in uh, historic terms, uh, the yield is not yet on a low, unlike many other parts of the market. And the fourth point we mentioned already before is. It's not really apparent this is an industry or a business which is terif ter terrifically bad impacted by, by COVID-19, unlike the more obvious uh, um, industries such as transport, hotels, leisure, real estate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going into further details about the company, and I'm not telling you you must buy this bond right now, by all means, no. Um, but this was just a very quick exercise to, in order to, to show you um, how can you, in a relatively quick manner, trying to figure out where could be potentially attractive uh, market segments around? I'll we'll try to apply your uh, your focus. <laughs> Thanks. Any other uh, ones uh, or I don't know. You you tell me. Do we have time for for uh, some more? Well, but at least uh, for one more, please go ahead. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I've seen in the, uh, I'm in the, I've seen in the question somebody asked for Latin America. Yes, exactly. That's uh, one of uh, the most uh, interesting ones. It's, uh, um, Latin America is considered to be the highest yield. So tell me, Petrobras, Pemex, what else? The rest and what they have. What we should find in that uh, selection too is a bond from uh, Cemex, uh, which has a 6% coupon and a 2024 maturity. Okay. Um, Basically, it should be within that selection, but just uh, search for it like that. So yeah, it would be faster. Which year maturity? Oh, sorry, it was Cemex with a C. Yeah, which year? Uh, 2024, but use Cemex, not you, you, with a C for Charlie instead of a P. Oh, Cemex, sorry. Yeah. 
Sorry. <laughs> I come with it like this. I <laughs> got used to it. A single letter can make a big difference, Lana. I know, I know. But um, so in dollars, correct? Right. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, always be attentive uh, when you make the investments. Sometimes one letter makes the difference. Right, right. So thank you. That bond was also um, on the, the selection we, we made before. It was basically, if you, we looked at the chart, it was quite close to what we've been looking at before. Um, there is a little tweak to this bond. If you can quickly go up to the um, fundamental, what you see on the top right hand, it is has a, a, a put um, from the issuer, which is will come in in just one year's time. Huh? Um, please guide me. Uh, watch out uh, on the top end line. You see on the right hand side redemption. Yeah. So there is a put which could come in in one year's time. So. In the worst case scenario, we're not holding that bond for uh, more than a year. It's yeah, actually only yeah. nine See, months. We have a few ones actually in our own redemption. Exactly, exactly. But that's uh, unfortunately we need to accept if we want to have some sort of yield. So the question is, why do we like this particular bond? And now if you look at the yield or price graph um, over the last year, or you have three months. Can you do one year, please? Hmm. You usually apply like one year dynamics, yeah? Yes, exactly, yes. So you see that one is what I just told you before. Today we, we have a yield level which is even lower than what we have before the crisis. And if you click on the spread, it's probably about the same. Huh? It should be. Okay, we got a spread level which is still above the level we had in, in February, but there's not, not an awful lot we can further compress. Um, but the good thing, okay, we still have a bit of spread potential spread compression left here. So the question is, okay, why uh, I'm coming up with this uh, Semex bond here? And so this time it's not a, a relative comparison I did um, compared to, to other bonds. As a matter of fact, if you compare this one um, to its rating bracket and also its industry, it's, it's mostly average. So I cannot even say uh, if we compare this to the same rating bracket or again to the industry, it, it's trading on pretty much average. So there's no relative attractiveness yeah. of the bond. Yeah, but what, trading is almost the same. Yeah, exactly. What I like is, is uh, if you go, is, is essentially the, the underlying um, business fundamental of, of the company. And here, of course, I did a bit of background check before. But if you go on the issuer page of um, that bond, mm -hmm. on it now. you have this you have this very appealing uh, section or where you provide the last financial statements of the company. Exactly. Yeah, that's what you should take into consideration for sure. And not only exactly. That. By the way, you, this is available for Semex because it's a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. For Nova Chemical, which it, it, this is a private company, so this is not was not available. Mm -hmm. But what you see in here, we the only it, it only needs like thirty seconds to look on this um, second quarter result, or you could even look at first quarter result. But what you're going to see in here on the very top line or in the top section um, where you see net sales, you see actually over the first six months of this the year, the net sales of this company decreased by only 8%, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine that's a company which is one of the major um, producers of concrete and cement, et cetera, for building materials with operations around the world. So imagine we had a crisis such as COVID-19 and, and, and sales of a company whose business, of course, is heavily impacted by um, the decrease of construction activity. Sales go only back by 8%. I mean, most GDP ratios around um, most of Western countries in the world decrease by 10 or even more on an annualized basis. So that looks as if the situation, generally speaking, was pretty much under control. 
And now, of course, this is a statement with an assessment I did within 30 seconds. This is not a thorough background check uh, where I looked at all the accounting gimmicks, et cetera, et cetera. So just to put this into perspective, right? But still, it tells me quite a bit about this company, whether it could actually be attractive to earn a 5% yield with the 3% um, time horizon left until maturity, uh, sorry, four, four years, uh, for a business which apparently, according to what they tell me out of, of the last financial report, isn't overly uh, impacted by COVID-19. Um, we would, if you look further into that balance sheet, you would even see that they hold $2 billion of dollar cash. So that would be an additional add-on. But again, let's keep it like this. This is not the thorough uh, assessment of that financial situation. This was just an exercise of within five minutes trying to find a potentially attractive um, angle in the market. Right. And right. I think, uh, we should uh, finish with this. Uh, so, um, uh, just asking a few questions. So, um, let's go back to that question. What kind of uh, uh, EM issuers uh, you have in your portfolio or just focusing on them? Maybe some Turkey, maybe some Latin America. What, what kind of things are you focusing on? Lately. Right. To, to, to tell the truth, yes, uh, we have a, a bit of quite a bit of exposure to Turkey, and as you probably know, um, Turkey is among the um, countries with the highest um, yields in, in U.S. dollar terms around the, the world. Of course, that has to do with the fact that uh, there is a severe currency crisis ongoing, and the um, macroeconomic situation is anything but bright in, in Turkey, to put it short. Um, but for example, what we do have there is exposure to some of the large private sector banks, uh, corporate banks, uh, private sector banks, where we have bonds with maturities into 2020, 21, eventually 2022. And the idea is that none of these in, um, banks will, will all default within the next few months altogether, right? So, I mean, this is really... <laughs> um, a quick, quick brush up of, of the situation. But yes, I mean, we do need to take some sort of risks and, and that's at least uh, an angle within the market where we find we are compensated with a bit of, of uh, return for the risk we take. Okay. Andreas, thank you very much for sharing your insights and your practices. It's, uh, it is really valuable because uh, your performance of the portfolio really uh, drew my attention uh, from your website. All right, then uh, we are passing to uh, our final speaker, but uh, I'm, I hope everyone can make uh, made it uh, up to the end because that's uh, one of the most experienced uh, persons which I know at the market who is dealing with the uh, uh, emerging markets. So we'll have Marcus met here from Claris Capital. Uh, he's a former uh, UBS uh, executive director. He uh, basically spent my whole life in UBS uh, and uh, he's a real expert. Their company basically managing different kind of portfolios and they are focusing on uh, high yield uh, opportunities at the market. So Marcus, please, I, it would be a great pleasure for you to hear uh, your expertise on your uh, strategies right now. Thank you, Lana. Uh, thank you to the speakers before. Uh, interesting uh, contribution, I have to say. Uh, maybe a word about uh, Clarus. We are uh, a young, uh, fast-growing asset management. We are attracting assets from independent asset managers, and we are offering them uh, discretionary accounts and uh, advisory accounts. Uh, within the discretionary area, we have uh, balanced uh, portfolios and uh, yield portfolios. Uh, total assets under management are around one and a half billion. Uh, we, we have about like 700 uh, million in uh, fixed income assets, mainly uh, single bonds. Um, 
the rule is uh, we have like two thirds of uh, so in the discretionary accounts we have about two thirds investment grade and one third uh, EM high yield. Um, I would say typical typical maybe Swiss retail uh, like household names um, not too long. Um, not too big size, uh, rather a lot and small size, well diversified. And uh, yeah, I started the, with Clarus um, half a year ago in January. Uh, everything, everything seems uh, seem to be okay. Um, balanced account when equities lost uh, the, uh, the bond could uh, recover or could could uh, even make uh, some some gain against. But then we had like this this uh, this crisis and everything dropped like like a stone we can say, and uh, unless the central banks came in, um, there was we had quite a bit of a yeah difficult times and I went through different crises but such such uh, moves I haven't seen uh, never seen liquidity was terrible and. Um, at that time, then we decided uh, to to um, uh, clean up our portfolios a bit, like um, going out of the weak sectors like transport and so on, and but going into very long duration bonds like from triple B uh, sector like the the, the too big to fails GMs and uh, and so on. And uh, this trade uh, worked out pretty, pretty okay, I have to say. Uh, now we are thinking to to come back uh, from from the long end, especially in the better rated names. We are a bit scared that like the economy uh, could uh, recover a bit. Maybe there is a vaccine. Maybe we have uh, like some profit taking in the in the in the. Um, uh, risk-free rates like in the 10-year or 10-year uh, 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 yields are very low uh, the curve is flat so we are a bit scared on the long end so we would not go into a microsoft 10-year at one percent that is that is not our uh, our aim uh, we rather would go like uh, um, with those money so with this uh, we would go like into triple b area uh, Maximum double B, uh, high yield EM stuff, uh, but as well we have like hybrid sector, which is uh, in my opinion pretty pretty attractive. Uh, we have seen like uh, hybrids from Lufthansa even paid from from uh, different uh, different sectors they they paid, although they don't pay dividends. Um, and we have uh, the AT1 sector, which is uh, still, uh, in my opinion, attractive. So far, we haven't seen any major problem with banks. Uh, all looks on, under control, and they offer some some good uh, yield opportunities. So I would say, like we are trying to make a mix out of out of this area. Uh, uh, to go into uh, such names, uh, then uh, EM obviously. EM has uh, still, I think, still a bit uh, to go. Um, we ha we had like problems, or or we had the double whammy from oil and COVID in an EM. Oil is recovering a bit, but I think I think there is still some some room to do. We concentrate on big names. Uh, like on the government owned or like, like the big companies uh, or the well diversified companies um, yeah uh, maybe you can show the the list we we are looking at and we can go through the names You had Femex. No, it's not. Ah, okay. 
Yeah, okay, I, I take my Excel. So maybe if we start with the hybrids, uh, uh, for example, one hybrid which just came out recently is uh, San Miguel from Philippine. San Miguel uh, from Philippines is, is a huge conglomerate. Um, they have uh, all sorts of, uh, of business, energy, food, beer, you know, you might, you might know. Uh, so their, their sales is up to close to 10% or, uh, to 5% uh, of GDP, which this is an important uh, group in the Philippines. All Philippines are not rated. They pay you a five and a half coupon. Uh, and uh, the call is uh, in 25, gives you a 550 yield for a name which is in the market uh, since a long time and we never had a problem with the Philippine names. Uh, BP, you know, uh, then on the on the um, 81s, I think uh, the recently issued uh, Credit Suisse uh, with a yield of uh, 5% to the call or an ING, uh, call uh, 29 at 520, uh, good names, 5%, uh, pretty solid, I would say. On the on the triple B, double B stuff, there it starts a bit, bit more difficult because of our central banks uh, putting money to work. Uh, we would go for names like Freeport, McMoran, or ArcelorMittal, uh, they still offer some some value, I think, with uh, yields of like uh, uh, three per, around three percent. If we go then like to the um, to the EM world in uh, Brazil, uh, apart from uh, Petrobras, uh, I would uh, would uh, propose uh, JBS, which is like the largest meat producer in the world. Uh, they are not only in Brazil, they have a strong business uh, in the US. It's a double B plus credit uh, or more than 4%, 470. Uh, we have like uh, maybe a name not that well known, a group of Kuo from Mexico, which is like uh, a conglomerate, uh, pretty solid, double B, uh, 670 uh, yield. Uh, we have like Pemex, we know, we discussed. Uh, we have Columbia Telecom, which came to the market uh, with a yield of more than 4% for, uh, for a 10 year maturity. Then we have like the Oman grid from the Middle East, Oman. So like the, the, like the, the grid of Oman, which is owned uh, partially by a Chinese grid, 49% and the rest by the government. Uh, 27 bonds, double B, 6%. Uh, then a big name from India, Adani Ports, which is like the, the largest private uh, port operator in India. Uh, during the COVID, they, uh, fully, they fully functioned. Uh, leverage is about three times, which is acceptable. And uh, if we go into China, big name country, uh, country garden, like one of the largest property uh, uh, firms, uh, gives you like uh, close to close to five uh, percent. Uh, so these are names we are looking at. I think uh, four or five percent is still possible with acceptable names with uh, big names. Yeah, I should say. <laughs> It was one of the loud for me here. Let me check. Uh, well, I should say just uh, lately uh, there were some names which I noticed uh, were really popular at uh, our platform lately. So people really were asking about such ones, and I believe uh, you are definitely with this uh, necessary strategy. Um, so, uh, as of now, uh, how do you? basically evaluate uh, some bonds. Have you applied maybe some um, different approaches to your um, portfolio of management? So you can put it uh, to corporate ones, so you stick to- No, I mean, I would I would say like the approach is, is pretty similar, uh, but, we, but we don't, at the moment, we are not that scared about duration in the weaker names. 
I said before on the good names, like on the on the single A's, uh, triple B names, there we reduce duration. But if we have like uh, weaker names, we don't. We are not scared about going longer. Uh, for example, now in Turkey, we have a crisis. Another one, people are kind of getting used to. Uh, I mean, we see it rather as an opportunity. But if we 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 uh, add Turkey, then we would add at the long end the low price uh, dollar, the convex bonds. So like the forty seven or uh, or because the the crisis. Is, I mean, the crisis will not be over or that the whole situation will not be over. Of course, if you have a, a very short dated bond, like a half a year bond, then you can keep it. Uh, but uh, as an investment, I rather would say buy Turkey on weakness and buy, go for the long end. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, some uh, DM names, like for instance, from UK? Um, well, you mentioned some banking uh, names like ING, but they were from uh, Netherlands, if I remember. Maybe something from uh, UK? I yeah, I mean, uh, the UK, I, I would say like the same. Uh, it's just a bit more more um, uncertain because of like this Brexit. and But uh, Barclays just came to the market with uh, with an 81. It went uh, pretty well, um, I think. Um, uh, you can. This is a pretty good, good, good investment. When it comes to like to sterling investments, then it's uh, it starts to be uh, difficult. Uh, uh, we have a few EM names, uh, but uh, nothing else. Uh, I see in the chat. So, um, yeah, Andrew so, well, basically, just lately, I was more focusing on bonds, and uh, uh, it's also relevant for bonds as, uh, as well. So, what are your expectations uh, for, uh, like, chain uh, hotel hotels uh, chain um, airlines, uh, uh, cruise lines? Uh, will they get enough support in terms of the uh, industry? Will you hold them in your portfolio? Uh, no, we, we, we do not own cruise lines, uh, definitely not. Uh, we might have some advisory clients uh, trying to make a trade out of these like uh, secured uh, bonds uh, recently issued. Uh, but in our portfolios, we don't hold, uh, we don't hold uh, hotels. Uh, so all the travel business uh, we, we avoid, uh, like airline business as well, uh, well, as well, apart from Lufthansa. Well, uh, they are rather stable ones. So, but uh, you, know, you are so experienced. Uh, I believe you you can take kind of like hybrid ones. I really like to avoid them because uh, I don't know. They seem really tricky. I like plain vanilla ones, so just everything could be very simple, very understandable. And um, but what do you think about uh, green ones? Uh, do you have them in their uh, in your portfolio? They seem to be rather popular. Um, yeah, uh, yes, uh, it's not, so far it's not an issue on our side, it's, we, we not, uh, I mean, if it's green, yes, but uh, we do not like uh, create like pot green portfolios or so. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. um, so we have also the questions about um, maybe some other uh, issues, for instance, Indian names, uh, apart from Adani, maybe you have uh, something additional in your portfolio that could be um, rather stable. And I should say, uh, I, I just wanted to get your opinion on uh, Indian issues as well, because they are, uh, I'm just tracking their uh, statistics on COVID and they really surprise me in a bad way, because now uh, it increases really uh, a lot. So, how will it uh, reflect on on their um, ability to pay the debt? I mean, in India, I think you have uh, two sorts of of uh, of credit. So, you have the big ones. In this, in my opinion, Adani is one of them. Then we had uh, Realliance uh, Industries, which came to the market recently. These are big, big uh, names. Uh, we have. 
maybe the uh, one name which is a bit uh, yeah uh, difficult to charge uh, Tata. Yes. But it's, it's a big name as well, and uh, and I would clearly stay with the big names in India, and not going for not go for like small business uh, with with uh, nothing. Uh, if you need to have a report, uh, you won't find anything, and stay with the big names. Yeah. Uh, even okay, banks now um, uh, there are not that many banks anymore. Uh, bonds outstanding, but there are still some some banks like state-owned banks. They have the support from the government, so. So when you're picking right now the bonds, what kind of things and indicators you take into consideration additional? Do you study the whole uh, industry trends uh, or maybe delve into a uh, issue, some details? What kind of additional things can be uh, uh, our backup plan <laughs> just to make sure that uh, it is really healthy? Bond. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's dif difficult. I mean, if it depends on the sector you are. Uh, if you are in oil or if you are in EM, you have to watch oil closely. Uh, but when it starts to 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 to, uh, to go down, then you should should stay uh, should stay calm and and uh, maybe uh, not uh, sell in panic so it's rather it's 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 better to, uh, maybe to, to hold a, a bit of a, of your portfolio uh, in easy cash so kind of cash that you once you have a correction you can step in but uh, what do you watch i mean we are not different than to to others there is no secret i guess <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for some of us, for some, it is not a secret, but uh, sometimes you need to change the perspective just to. Well, oh, I, th I think may maybe we are a bit different. If we, we for like a, we are not too scared about long maturities. I go to go into perpetuals and uh, and so on. We are not that scared. I mean. Once you still have like some some way to go, that spreads are not totally compressed. We are still we are not where we have been in in February. So there is still a bit of room. There is new supply. A lot of supply needs to be digested. So there will always always be an opportunity. And uh, and uh, at the moment, I think the next opportunity could be again Turkey. Uh, yeah, it should be rather uh, attractive for investments, and I believe they can um, hold their positions. All right, Marcus, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm really pleased that uh, you were able to make it. And uh, then uh, let me leave uh, additional comments, and uh, I believe. Uh, so I will um, say a few words uh, directly to the audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, well, thank you very much for everyone who uh, joins uh, our uh, seminar today. I saw uh, each of you joined us uh, from different uh, timing zones, uh, so it's really much appreciated. Um, as of my side, uh, you see, as I already mentioned, I've been working with uh, uh, different uh, portfolio managers um, rather actively every <laughs> day, all night, uh, sometimes even. So uh, helping them to make um, the evaluations of bonds. So I also um, have some kind of uh, things, uh, kind of like life hacks. Uh, which I wanted to share with you if you're active with bonds. So probably let me just uh, share the screen additionally. I will um, simply draw your attention to a few indicators which uh, I believe uh, should be essential uh, if you uh, if you actually build into this. Go. Sorry for the delay. Um, all right, then, um, well, when you 
uh, already have your portfolio. Uh, you know, now the times are really um, so volatile, so dynamic. So in any case, if you already have some bonds, you need to track them. Track them at least one or uh, twice, uh, uh, once or uh, twice uh, in two weeks or at least. Uh, of course, uh, bonds are not that hectic as uh, stocks, but in any case, you need to make sure. We had a uh, leak from our rating agencies, and I should say they uh, sent us all the uh, updates, um, their forecasts uh, daily. So uh, if you track your bonds, track them in one place, so you at least uh, have them. For instance, in uh, C bonds, we do have a um, watch list which will help you to track um, all different things what's happened with your bonds. So you could be at least aware of what is happening because if you have the information, you are prepared. Um, you know, I have a uh, rather good um, skill for life, but it also appears uh, to basically investing. Uh, you need to foresee different scenarios and be prepared uh, for all kinds of situations, then you can act accordingly, not just uh, emotionally. So for instance, in the watch list, uh, you see um, all the difference uh, with the pricing. If the bond is falling down, you should be worried about it. For instance, uh, just set your notifications, your alerts on the price. Um, put them uh, kind of like your price triggers when you're ready to buy it or to sell it. Um, also, we have the system of alerts, uh, which will warn you about, uh, well, for instance, the changes of ratings. Uh, now we update them four times a day. Uh, so if uh, the rating is changed with a negative forecast, that's at least one of the indicators for you. Uh, to act accordingly. Um, it's up to you to buy it, uh, to sell it right now or not, but at least your attention will be focused on that. Um, maybe there could be uh, uh, not paid courts. It is called technical default, so you could uh, be warned about it. Um, also, when you choose uh, new boards, well, I will not perform right now the search is well basically you, you uh, saw how we did it with Andreas. Um, it's up to you to apply different filters uh, with the yield, but you should understand if the yield is high, the rating um, won't be that high. <laughs> but at least uh, you need to uh, apply, for instance, the rating scale within uh, which scale you're ready to risk. Um, it's um, there would be a few ways how you could uh, track by the issue or by issue. Uh, I should say that um, it's actually up to you. Um, I would rather follow an uh, issue rating because, uh, as I like to say, uh, fish dies from the hat. So, um, of course, issues can apply not only for uh, all the rating agencies, um, but it's a rather expensive thing. Uh, but um, if you don't want to guess, I would recommend you to use max rating and you could see what kind of scale you want. Um, also, just wanted to draw your attention. Uh, some uh, platforms, they can indicate uh, kind of like uh, low risk or uh, high risk. Um, well, if uh, for me, uh, low risk can be considered in one point. For you, it could be in a different one. So you just need to make sure that you actually get all the information, uh, the, the, to the total information. Well, let me open one of the ones so everything will be more or less visual. So at our system, we provide you at the top the information on the uh, um, information from uh, Moody's, Fitch, and s &P. And actually, we support not only uh, all these, but also we can go back. Um, we also support the ratings from around 70 agencies. They can be local ones. 
and uh, if the wound is raised by local uh, racing agencies, you can also follow it. And you know exactly what is the rating. For each level of the rating, um, a certain uh, situation, the market situation stands after that. Um, also, what kind of things you should pay attention to? Well, in case you are picking the bond, pay attention that here you see the status outstanding. Uh, in case uh, it is in default, it would be up. Uh, what kind of things could draw your attention? Well, Andreas said they like to draw uh, their attention of the uh, price changes within one year. It's a good thing. Uh, so just try to see to analyze the uh, this chart. Uh, if the bond is more or less liquid, it will give you a better understanding um, that you will be able to sell it and to buy it. Uh, you can see all the calls, basically how uh, all these stock exchanges, all the market makers evaluate it. Uh, so at least you should uh, see uh, what is the current value right now from um, around 300 sources. Uh, additionally, I would recommend you to analyze the volumes. Uh, for instance, you could uh, open some of uh, uh, the stock exchanges and you can see uh, the chart with the volumes. It also gives you understanding of the liquidity. Um, what else? Um, well, be aware of what you're buying. Uh, of course, uh, if it's not even a hybrid or structured bonds, uh, they are rather difficult ones. It is <laughs> rather for professionals. Uh, I would rather say that you need to at least uh, read the prospectus, uh, what kind of, for which purposes um, these bonds are taken, what are the terms for this. So we have them in section files. Um, well, for instance, uh, I just opened the Teva Pharmaceuticals, one of uh, the most popular ones lately, but um, uh, this is one traded uh, below 100. So I like everything which is traded not over 100. Um, so we additionally, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, all the terms are written in the prospectus. We also additionally state your comments. Your common, uh, these comments are actually your uh, insurance because there are all the terms, they are linked and you can see at which uh, page it is uh, given. Um, also, one of uh, our uh, portfolio managers uh, mentioned that you need to uh, see not only the one but also the issuer and a few things which um, you should take into consideration these are of course financial reports some of the issues might not be rated that's why you have no indication of risk um, so the financial reports so the um debt price uh, EBITDA, uh they would be main indicators for you also well we um information on the institutional holders. These are also one of your um, good recommendations. For instance, all these funds, they uh, have these bonds in their portfolio. So if rather wise people manage their portfolios, uh, have them in uh, these bonds, have these bonds in their portfolio, uh, probably they are aware of what they are doing. <laughs> so at least it could be one of uh, the benchmark. Uh, what else? Uh, try to analyze the issue. Try to analyze uh, what depth they have. Um, so we have uh, open the browser. We have here um, the bond depth, um, the, the spread, what kind of uh, depth they have in different currencies. Uh, you could at least understand uh, how many that they have. Well, we uh, also, it, it has a fancy way in the chart. Um, analyze, uh, for instance, with the corporates, uh, it uh, even goes better if the company issued stocks, you have it. 
uh, and the charts, so you can see the volumes and um, the uh, performance of their stocks. Um, just kind of the indicator because stocks are usually uh, more hectic, uh, they are more volatile, and um, kind of like reflect the market mood. Uh, what else? Well, if you analyzed um, some particular bonds, I would recommend you to uh, use some indicators. Uh, for instance, uh, indices, we, in indices, we have um, CDSs. They are called countries um, credit default swaps. Uh, this is basically the risk, and you can uh, at least understand the risk of the country. Uh, because it also corresponds, uh, you know, um, corporates, they don't, uh, uh, they don't just simply exist. <laughs> they are, uh, they uh, live in, in this particular country. Oh, let me show, for instance, uh, for Brazil. Uh, these are basically all the ones taken. For Brazil, you can enlarge the chart and see how it is moving, and you can uh, compare one um, uh, CDS, for instance, Brazil, and uh, compare uh, Argentina. Just see how they correspond and choose. Uh, the country uh, depending on their con uh, current risk. Um, what else? Well, uh, the new thing um, maybe you haven't noticed, we also have uh, the commands uh, uh, from scope ratings. It's one of the uh, hugest European banks, uh, sorry, rating agencies. So uh, now you can read additional commands to their forecasts. Um, well, basically, these are main indicators, but I'm sure uh, I, I have more <laughs> to say, but um, probably you're uh, already rather tired for uh, having today, you know, online, it is a bit different if, uh, you know, unless you uh, attend some uh, offline. All right, then uh, if you have questions, please, um, uh, leave your comments in the chat. I will right now check uh, what kind of things uh, you are curious to know more. Uh, in case I wasn't able to answer all your questions yet, uh, you have uh, my uh, contact details. Uh, in case you're curious to evaluate how healthy your portfolio is right now, or maybe you want to make the market screening in a more advanced way, like uh, our speakers uh, have done today with me, so uh, go ahead. I will provide you my personal support. We'll discuss with you what kind of things you should do in your portfolio. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. Maybe we can help you to avoid different risks. Because, well, risks, they are not uh, always bad. Uh, at least I consider risks of two kinds. One is the uh, conscious one, and it is a always positive one. Because you're aware of all your terms, uh, you're aware of what uh, you're doing, and thus uh, it depends actually on your risk profile. And there are some blind risks uh, which you should definitely avoid. Uh, it's a really silly thing in case you can uh, actually avoid them. Uh, so uh, the last chance to ask uh, to leave uh, questions to me. Come on. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, in case uh, there are no, uh, thank you for uh, attending this seminar and um, uh, please take care and all my best wishes to you. Thank you.